So briefly, here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to, I, you know, I've had two cups of coffee. Those of you who know me know that I think I'm probably a little hypomanic most of the time. Um, so I'm going to try and power through this as quickly as I can. So I'd like to hold questions until the end just so that I can make sure I get through it all. One of the things I've been um, very much involved with for the last couple of years is the end of life work. And the, through the end of life working module, I was the chair of the uh, working group that developed the module um, and all of the parts of it. But as a, part, as a result of that, I've also been very much working with the Ministry of Health um, around trying to educate physicians around the changes to consent legislation that have basically now made advanced directives a legally binding document, legally binding on everyone, including um, your, your ambulance uh, services. So if a patient has a, an advanced directive that is, a, that is properly witnessed by two people, not a physician, we don't witness those, um, and they've, somebody started CPR in the field, as soon as you are aware of that, that advanced directive, if it says, I do not wish CPR, you must stop, no matter what, because that is a consent a refusal of treatment, and so they're, 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 they are legally binding. Um, the My Voice tool has now become available, finally, they've uh, upgraded it to be, cons to be consistent with the legislation. It is about a 60-page document, but the back half of it is actually all just forms. They're all just templates for the patients. If they wish to do an advanced directive, they don't have to go to a lawyer, so there's a template there that they can use, they can photocopy, they can fill it in, and have their two neighbors um, sign it as their witnesses. So don't be, don't be put off by how thick, how big the new document is. I think all of you would have gotten uh, four to six copies of them in the mail with a cover letter from uh, the GPSC. The, the actual important pieces are not a huge part of it. Uh, through the end-of-life PSP module, we, I've done a little primer that says pages X, Y, Z are the ones that are important for you in your practice to discuss, but the rest of it is a workbook for the patient to work through with their family so that everybody within the family is on the same page as what does the patient. Um, advanced care planning is, you know, it's part of the planning discussion, not just at the end of life. I think too long, too many of us think of advanced care planning just as that, I'm going to die in the next six months, and what do I want done? Well, it isn't. It's actually something that, quite frankly, just like a will, needs to be started early and re reviewed regularly and modified as your life circumstances change. Having an advanced care plan when you're 20 will look different than when you become 70, but you should still have something there that says what you want to happen under certain circumstances um, and who you want to speak for you if you're not able to speak for yourself. So that's really what the planning process is. An advanced care plan is an iterative, ongoing process. So the palliative care, so I started, I thought we'd start with the palliative care stuff. Um, preparing an advanced care plan, obviously when people are in that palliative stage, <coughs> sort of the last six, six months or so of life, it's very important to know what they want, where they want to be treated, do they want to stay at home, um, what is their family, having their family involved, knowing what community services are available to help support them. And that's part of what the PSP module is working at doing, is trying to help on local levels develop strategies for managing patients who wish to stay in the community. We are going to look at moving that module further down into long-term care facilities as well. Um, one of my friends who has worked a lot, of, she was a medical director at one of our local long-term care facilities in Poco. When she'd go on holidays, I'd get to go and practice real medicine. It was lots of fun. And I'd go in and cover the, cover the, the, uh, the home for her and she, would ha she had about 120 patients. And I'd go and see them. Well, this last time we had a fellow who had been seen at Eagle Ridge Hospital. He was had de end stage dementia. He was also a, a had end stage COPD, and they had had the discussion with his wife and him. How much he understood about it is hard to say, and she agreed that he should be deemed palliative. So they did all the right things, changed the level of intervention and all that stuff. He also had diabetes. He comes back to the long term care facility. They're still doing glucometers four times a day and testing. You know, and, and I'm going, okay. Palliation means no, we're not aggressively managing illnesses. We are treating symptoms to keep the patient comfortable. So why are we poking this man? Why are we, why are we torturing him that way? So I talked to his wife about the circumstances. And I said, you know, there isn't any need at this point. The purpose of trying to control his blood sugars is to prevent end stage organ failure. Hmm. You know, we're palliative. We're already kind of there. It's, 
obviously not in those words when I'm talking to her, but you know. <laughs> um, and she agreed that we would stop everything. And he, he actually went on to pass away about a week and a half later. But very comfortable. She was very happy with the care. And the fact that he wasn't being roused, you know, people coming in and poking him four times a day because it wasn't appropriate. So we want to look at moving the end of life module to, to redefine it as well for within the long-term care facility because I think we all need to start looking at just because a person has a certain condition is the treatment what we need to do. People are not just the sum of their conditions. They are an entire person. They have a life, they have a family, they have wishes. Don't just treat the disease, look at the person. And that applies at an earlier stage, not just at the end of life stage. Um, so with the palliative care fees, as you know, it, you, the, the palliative planning fee, which is about a half an hour, well, that's, a, that's the minimum amount of time. It usually takes you to have that kind of a discussion with family. And once you have billed the palliative care planning fee, the 14063, um, you are now able to access, there's a new fee code for the telephone email follow-up um, advice to patients. We used to have the separate fee codes, one for complex care, one for COPD, one for mental health, and one for palliative. And people, I think, didn't bill them because they would get confused as, okay, is, well, did I talk to this patient about that disease? So is it that one that I'm going to bill it under? It was really confusing. So we com condensed them into a single fee code, the 14079, billable up to five times in the calendar year after you have successfully billed any one of the, or more, of the uh, portal fees. So the portal fees are still the complex care planning fee, the mental health planning fee, the palliative planning fee, and the COPD CDM. And we, and we included COPD as being accessing that specifically because we know that, for, for instance, over the flu season and that, a lot of times the management of your, CO, your patients with COPD, you really don't want them coming into your office to be exposed to all those virus, that, you know, that virus cesspool in your waiting room, um, because then they will end up in the hospital. So it's mo very beneficial to be able to manage them with some phone advice. So the, f the, the four portal fees are still the same, but now with any one of those four portal fees, you, you would build a 14079 rather than the, the fee specific to that uh, planning fee. The, a couple of years ago, we did, Matt, we, we've aligned the um, facility, uh, terminal care and facility fee, the, one, the 00127, the definition we aligned with the palliative benefits, which is not just cancer, not just AIDS, but now includes any end stage medical condition. And the palliative care planning fee also is that same larger group. I think we all have a lot more difficulty with the, not, it's much easier when patients have cancer to say you're palliative, often much easier with patients who have terminal AIDS to, to talk about being palliative and what that means. It's much harder, I know, for all of us to, to decide when is my patient with this complex comorbidities and when is their CHF really at that palliative phase. It's really, it's a hard decision and I think that's part of what we're trying to do with the end of life module is encourage specialists to also be involved in the module so that together we can help understand when patients reach that point and when it's appropriate to start having those discussions and both sides because you know there's nothing worse as you know as a family doctor having four different subspecialists all seeing different parts of your patient forgetting that the patient's a whole person um, and you get three of them agree it's time to say look at palliative and one who goes but no we're going to keep them on all of these anti-lipid drugs and all of this and you're going kind of everything's at, at odds with each other. When I, talk, when I talk to some of the specialists involved in the end of life module, I say, okay, we want you, one of the tips we're trying to get family doctors to use is the surprise question. Um, would I be surprised if this patient were to die in the next six to 12 months? And if your answer to that is, I wouldn't be surprised, then you need to think about having that discussion with the patient. The patient may not be ready to have the discussion with you yet, but you need to flag that as a person that you wanna have that discussion. And I've tried to get the specialist to use that as well. So I say, okay, so you're maybe a cardiologist and you're seeing Mrs. Jones here for her chronic CHF. So first of all, look at her through your, your, cardi your cardiology eyes and say, would I be surprised if this patient were to die from her CHF in the next six to 12 months? And if your answer was, actually I would be surprised, she's pretty stable, then take a step back. Be the general internist that you were actually also trained to be and look at her as a whole person with all of her comorbidities and ask yourself that same question. Would I be surprised if this patient were to die of some of these combination of comorbidities in the next six to 12 months? And if your answer to that is, actually I wouldn't be surprised, then use that knowledge 
and turn it around and reflect that within your recommendations back to the family doctor about the cardiac conditions. Because we all need to be a part of helping this patient go through that phase of their chronic disease. Palliation is just a part of the chronic disease management. And it's not a part I think we do very well at this stage. And I think it's because we all still think too much of that silo. I have to treat the diabetes. I have to do their A1Cs. I have to get them down below this. Forgetting that, you know what, when they're end stage of this, I think you're past the point. And you need to be able to have a discussion with the patient about what all of the drugs and everything do and, and how they interact with each other. So I think it's important that we get that, get specialists on that same train with us so that we can all be pushing in the same direction. So complex care, you've all heard me talk a bit about the complex care fee um, billable by the GP who accepts the role of longitudinal uh, continuity of care. That's pretty much all of the GPSC incentives with the exception of the um, advice fees for GPs with specialty training. Those are the only ones that aren't the MRP type of GP. Um, the big thing here is that we do want the patient and their family uh, and or their family representative to leave that planning process knowing this was a special visit and there's a plan of action or inaction as the system at the as the choices may be but there is a plan for my care over the next 12 months or so it isn't a short visit it's a it's 30 minutes but you know this is the time that you can organize your office set it up so that you can spend the time with the patients as you were talking about when you're when you're looking when you're on a sessional basis being able to spend that time the quality time, your patients love you. They will think you are the next best thing to slice bread. You're the best doctor that ever walked the, the, the planet because you spent time with them. GPSC has developed most of these, these incentives to try and encourage the family docs to get off the 10 minute treadmill and start to book your office to allow you to spend the time with the patients that are more complex, that we always talk about needing to be paid more for that time complexity and intensity that doesn't get paid through an office visit. The dual diagnoses haven't changed any. Um, the complex care fee, again, the, the 30 minutes there, it's not necessarily that the whole 30 minutes is face to face, but I dare say if five minutes is face to face and you're saying that 25 minutes is the rest of the planning piece, I just don't think you'd get past an audit. So do make sure that the majority of your 30 minutes is actually face to face with the patient. Um, and in the cases where, you, where maybe dementia is one of the complex comorbidities, and you know that, just like we talked earlier about the ADHD child, a 30-minute face-to-face visit with the child ain't going to happen. Um, but these, all of these fees do allow part of that time also to be spent with the family, not just with the patient. So in the, in the case of the, because I don't think I have mental health on this one, in the case of the mental health planning fee for the child and youth who has ADHD, seeing the, the, the parent first and then the child and that total time, if that planning visit to sit down and go through things, even if the part with the kid in the room as well isn't as big of a piece, that that's more to touch bases, that they're on side with the plan that's been discussed and, and oftentimes in large part decided with the parent in advance. It's that whole period of time that counts towards the planning fee, not just the amount of time with the patient. We accept that there are circumstances with, with child and youth and with with people who have, uh, have other disabilities like dementia and that, that not all the time is appropriate to be required to be with the patient themselves. And this one again also, or that one also opens up to the 14079, the, tel the telephone email fee. So the conferencing fees, you know, we have the different, we have the telephone fees, the follow up with the patient, that's that 14079. The fees for GPs conferencing with specialists or uh, GPs with specialty training by telephone. Uh, just the overview and then the fees for the GPs and the, for the specialists to provide that advice over the phone. So that's just some of the background on it. But what I want to do quickly is talk about the 14018 GP urgent telephone conferencing with a specialist or GP with specialty training <sighs> fee. That's hard to say without taking a breath. Um, and the GPs with specialty training may be your palliative care doc, could be your addictions doc, could be your mental health doc, because a number of those positions are filled by people whose credentials say they're a GP and they're not FRCP. So we, you know, we wanted to recognize that, that they're providing you with that expertise and therefore why would we consider them any less special than an FRC specialist? Uh, so that's the GPSC one requires the urgency of the two hour response time is due to the patient's acuity. Something's going on with that patient that if you don't get some advice within that two hours, your only alternative is probably gonna to be to send them down to eMERGE. Or if you're in your, in your community hospital 
and you're wondering, can we manage the patient here? And this, uh, this applies even with obstetrics, right? So if you've, if you've got, let's say it's, a, it's someone where you're, I don't know, maybe, maybe a 32 weeker and your OB is busy somewhere else doing something and you need, and you need some advice and you have to call down to BC Women's. And you get that risk because you know that you, you, if you don't have some advice, you're going to have to be arranging transport out. And this often applies more to the communities where they don't have obstetrical uh, backup on site if they're going to transfer into the, into the regional referral centre. You know, any of that time that you need that advice within two hours in order to determine whether or not you can manage the patient safely where you are, um, then you can bill this for that response time. The specialist fee and the GPO specialty training fees, the, the two hours is just a response time. Theirs is not dependent on the medical acuity. We realize that as a gap because if the advice you get may come within two hours, but if it came in two hours or two days really didn't make a difference, you shouldn't be billing this fee code. If those patients fall under the community conferencing fee patients, which are end of life palliative, chronic comorbidities, mental health, and frail elderly, then you can bill that under the 14016, the community patient conferencing instead, because that one doesn't have a time requirement. You may put a call into, a, into the specialist on, on Tuesday or a fax over to their office, say, I need to talk to you in somewhere in the next, you know, couple of days is fine, and they'll call you back the day or two after. Then you can bill that as the 14016 on the day that you actually have that, that conferencing discussion. Uh, so this one's a, a flat fee of $40. It's not, the 14016 is a per 15 minute or greater portion one because it recognizes that you may have other things. You may need to also talk to a pharmacist. You may need to also talk to other people about what to do because it's, it's uh, more of a planning type of, of, of session. These are the, do any of you do, I mean, uh, obviously you do G, the GPO specialty training uh, types of things. So if any of you do, the re do these and you're the one who's responding to that, that uh, request for advice. If the response is less than two hours, it's a $60 fee. If the response is up to one week, it's a $40 fee. And then there's a telephone follow-up with the patient fee as well that's billable. Um, and none of these ones are diagnostic dependent. So unlike the, the 14016, the community patient conferencing fee, which is only for that group of patients, this could be about anybody. Now, obviously in mental health, you're, it qualifies anyways for the, the, the other ones for the practicing GP. So that's available for people who have, who, GPs who are practicing essentially as a specialist within their community. The, the definition of GP with specialty training is basically that you've been accepted by the, by the health authority um, as providing specialty services because you're working within one of their programs, whether it's a, a child and youth program or whether it's an addictions program or whether it's um, a palliative program. That's essentially what we use at GPSC as the definition because there is no specific credentialing level for GPs with specialty training and we don't want to move to that level um, because it's, it's a challenge in that way. Like, how do you decide which courses qualify you to be a palliative care doc? Well, some of it's experience, some of it's, you know, there's a whole, a whole bunch of things. I know that they are working towards a palliative care training program with the, the Royal College, um, but I think that right now we're, we're just, we want to know that someone has recognized, officially has recognized, um, now the health authority that doesn't have a process where they say, yes, we bless you with being a GP with specialty training. There isn't that kind of a process. But if you're part of the program, if you're working essentially as a psychiatrist within their, within their mental health program, then you would be considered a GP with specialty skills. <coughs> The, they are mirror fees to the, to the SSC fees. The Special Services Committee fees are restricted to people who have that, those four little letters, FRCP, uh, behind their names. And when they came to us, we recognized that there are a lot of GPs side by side with FRCP docs. Look at emergency medicine. There's a lot of CCFP EMs who are working side by side with FRCP EMs. And why should the FRCP EM be able to give advice to the doc in the community and get paid for it and not the CCFP EM? So that's a big part of why GPSC agreed to fund this mirror set of fees. The prevention fee, as you may recall, a year and a bit ago, we deleted the old cardiovascular risk assessment fee, which was very narrow, and brought in the new 14066, the personal health risk assessment fee. Um, its value is only $50, but you get 100 of them in a year instead of only 30 of the $100 ones. So you've got your maximum going from 3000 to 5000 in a year. It's billed in addition to an office visit. So with an average value of office visits at around $31 when you average out across all the different age ones. 
you know, that gives us just over $80 for that risk assessment visit, which is roughly the equivalent of a full physical. Full physicals, you know, the CCFP has put out an ar articles, full physicals as a screening tool are useless. They really do not have value. In a focused area, when you are using a full physical for a patient who has an underlying diagnosis of, say, diabetes, you are specifically looking for evidence of end organ damage. That is a different issue, but a full physical on a healthy individual as a screening tool is, does not have use. That is why it is not billable to MSP as a full physical in this province. In some provinces, they can, but not in this province. So what GPSC decided to do was broaden our prevention assessment fee to a broader population. When billed with an office visit, the total value is roughly the same as what a full physical is, and it allows you to spend the time to review a person's um, history as to what, what prevention and screening services have they had or not had that they need to have done. The uh, eligible population are the, the risk groups. And for now it has to stay like that because of the funding box that we live in because we all know what's happening with negotiations right now. Squat. Um, smokers, medical obesity of BMI 30 or greater, poor eating habits and physical inactivity. But I dare say that is probably 80% of the population of BC <laughs> is at risk based on this. What you want to do at that visit, let me see if I've got the next one, yeah. So part of what you're gonna do at that visit is, oh no, I will go to the next one. We want you to review them. It isn't just about talking about, let's say it is a smoker. It isn't just about talking about the smoking with them. That is a part of it. And by the way, brief smoking intervention, brief smoking cessation advice, not counseling, but advice, as a part of the office visit is billable under the office visit to MSP. Smoking cessation counseling is not billable as a counseling fee. Counseling fees are not billable for lifestyle advice. Office visit fees are billable for lifestyle advice when that lifestyle advice is part of your management of them as a person and talking about their life and their health. And so that's, so there's, that's where the difference is. You cannot bill an 0120 when you're, when you're doing anything about smoking. But if the smoking cessation advice is a part of your office visit, then it is billable to MSP. So again, it's not, it's not the, the risk factor is not all that you are focusing. I know it's a fine line, but it's, but it's, it's what MSP has at least agreed that they will let us give that advice and be able to bill for it, but just not using the counseling fee because the counseling fee of course is much higher in value than the office visit fee. The, oops, plug in or find another power source, 7%. Is this not plugged in? I'm gonna run. It's going to close on me. <laughs> Ian, Ian, <laughs> master techie guy. Um, anyways, the, uh, no, I don't even know where the mouse is, there it is. So what we want you to do for that smoker is we want you to look and say, okay, you are a smoker who happens to be a 53-year-old male. Have you had a digital rectal examination? Have you had stools for occult blood? Um, you know, you're not only that, maybe you've got a, you're, you're, um, an asthmatic. Have you had your flu shots with your asthma, right? It's, so it's a matter of looking at, in that individual person, the recommendations out of the lifetime prevention schedule and the other, the other, CD, the other guidelines as to what is recommended for screening and, and, and prevention for that, that individual. Where are they with that? If you're, you're a 48-year-old woman who's, who's o o overweight, so you would also qualify. When was your last pap test? When was your last mammogram? You know, like all of those sorts of questions that you need to think about. And oh, okay, you haven't had them well, then let's book for you to come back and have that pap test and breast exam. Here's a requisition. You can, you can contact the screening mammography program directly to make that appointment. Um, how, you know, are there any immunizations that we need to think of? So, so basically it isn't just to talk about what their risk factor is that allowed you to access this code, but it is to sit down and take that 20 minutes to look and see, so when are you due for your next X, Y, and Z things that should be done at your age? And that's what the purpose of it is, right? So it isn't, don't just think of it as an opportunity to talk about the smoking because it's the smoking and more. It's the, the weight and more. It's the diet and more. It's the exercise and more. The diagnostic code, as you can see here, you use the diagnostic code of the risk factor 
whether or not that's the main thing you actually talked about in the visit doesn't matter. That's use, use the diagnostic code. The 0100, the office visit that goes with it, you can use whatever diagnostic code you want. That doesn't have to be the same diagnostic code, but just the, the one for 066 must use one of those diagnostic codes. Can you build this um, with a complete You can build it with a complete physical if the complete physical is medically necessary. So you have to fulfill all the requirements of the visit code. So it has to be someone then who would have like diabetes or something where you do appropriately need to be doing a full physical every couple of years in order to look for end organ um, impact. So. Sir, can you also build this for a patient that has diabetes and hypertension? Do you already build the system? Yep. So the, because the CDMs are about management over the previous year. It's not about any one specific service. This is a specific service event. So absolutely, someone who has hypertension and is overweight and a smoker, well, the hypertension piece, you're, you're, you're doing your, your visits, your medication if they're on it. Um, part of that is around lifestyle, obviously exercise and salt and all those sorts of things. However, this gives you the opportunity to look beyond just that. It's to look at all the other pieces of their age, their sex, and what are the recommended things they sh that you should be doing within primary care you know, I mean, the one thing that we find is, what is it, stools for old coat blood, I think the last time they looked at it, something like only 13% of the eligible population are having it done. Well, and that's because most of us just kind of forget about it. We're so busy focusing on that diabetes or on that hypertension. We forget about the other pieces that come with primary care uh, medicine and the prevention piece. And so this is to give you that, pay you to take that little bit of extra time to step out of the disease silo and look at the patient as a whole. Yeah, okay, uh, I talked a bit about this al already, the telephone email follow-up. It is, you know, so it's a two-way email. So the patient can email you to ask, say, you know, this is what's going, because some people do like to use email. The security of email is something that you have to decide and work through with your patient. Secure emails are an issue, but it isn't something that the system is going to provide for you at this stage, not with patients. We're still trying to work on getting those secure emails physician to physician so that we can start to do some of our referrals by email instead of faxing and stuff like that. But that's, I'm not sure where we are in that world and who knows right now. But um, with, with, as far as with the patient goes, the email piece with the patient, when you look at what CMPA has a, has a little blurb about emailing patients. And the one thing at least is that if the patient has already given you their email address so that you know that if, when you get an email coming in that it is from that patient, because there's always the concern, is it really the patient that's asking me the advice or not? You have to be on good faith and we're on good faith that that is who it's from. And your response back to the patient then is what you get to, is what you get to bill for. So it's a two-way email, two-way communication. It's not just you sending an email blurb out to all of your patients who have COPD to say, remember, you know, stay away from kids who got the sniff and a little bit of fever. That's not, no, that's a, that's a, that's a blurb of information that goes out. That's not a two-way follow-up management of their COPD. So when it does come to email, make sure there's that two-way and it's specific for that patient. Um, so that you can confirm that. So it's basically the phone call on in electronic. <coughs> Multiple insurer visits. So this came in last year. We, this was part of our last negotiated agreement. The funding was available from April 1st of 2011. It took until July to get the one for ICBC done, and then it took until, I think it was October or November, November, to get the uh, one for WCB done, just because of some of the, the problems with the software at MSP. So basically what this is, is when the patient has a primary, their visit, the primary purpose for their visit is either from ICBC, so it's a car accident, or a work, a work safe injury, and the Azure hands are going on the door. Oh, by the way, doc, I need my diabetes prescription. Okay, sit down, look and see. Uh, let's see, well, you know, you haven't done any blood work in a year and a half. I'm going to give you another requisition. Um, you know, that little piece that you are, or it's your blood pressure, check the blood pressure, just so that you're filling in that little piece, giving you a prescription. Now you can bill MSP for that, oh, by the way. And what we had to explain to MSP was that back in the days, when I first came into practice here back in 1986, you know, I remember very well filling out the WCB form, faxing it in with the payment sheet, and getting a check in the mail for all of my WCB cases that year at 100%. I remember faxing in my, or 
sent, you know, faxing in my report to ICBC with a bill, getting it back at 100%. And if they had diabetes or hypertension, billing MSP an 0100 and getting paid 100%. Back in the early 90s when, and when MSP went, first brought in Teleplan as a payment processor, they unilaterally decided that both ICBC and WorkSafe were going to be processed through this Teleplan and oh by the way, now you only get, to pill, you only get paid for one. And they took away that, that piece that we had at 100%. It took us 20 years of negotiations to get them to agree that okay, we'll let you bill us for another 50%, but we're not paying 100%. So, you know, but now that it's there, if and when we have new global money in the future, the Secretary of General Practice, which is the SGP, can decide to gradually bring up the value of these two separate fees to the same value as an 0100, so that essentially MSP would eventually have to do that. It'll take us a while to get to that. <coughs> um, but that's, that's the one nice thing. So they do have to be separate fees, speed codes, because MSP has to be able to track along with them with WorkSafe and ICBC to make sure that they're actually there. So that's why you can't build the two O one hundreds. They're they're two separate two separate fee codes. So there's the one three zero seven zero when the primary reason is WorkSafe and the O oh, by the way is MSP and the one three zero seven five when the primary is ICBC and the O oh, by the way is MSP. Do remember to get your MOAs to check that they have changed the insurer though, or on your EMR, if you're doing your billing as you're doing your, doing your visit, make sure that you've changed the insurer back to MSP to bill one of these, because if you bill one of these and the insurer still says, because it'll default back to your, back to your work safe or your ICBC, if it still has that in there, you're gonna get rejected because it's not, one of, it's not their responsibility, it's MSP. So make sure you do go back and, and change the uh, insurer back to, uh, to that. So these um, went live back last year. We're now past February 4th. So if you have any that are more than 90 days of age um, since the date of service, if you've gone back, you know, and some people did keep a list. We had told them back in February to keep the list because we knew it was coming. Um, and if, you, if there were some that you'd missed and they're more than 90 days of age, you'll have to contact MSP and get permission to bill with submission code A. Um, but they will bill it as long as you don't wait until it's been more than 18 months since the date of service because once you get past 18 months from the date of service, you're SOL. Because they're just, they will not approve that. They figure if you can't stay on top of your billings and your rejections and those things that you need to rebuild closer than 18 months, it's too bad, so sad. Uh, group medical visits, that's another thing that we've, that we've managed to bring in. So we're trying to move a little bit away from the, the, the requirements of the eyeball, the whites of the eyeball one-on-one -on -one visits. We've got our telephone email advice fees through GPSC. We've got the group medical visits. Up until last summer, MSP had agreed that we could bill an 0100, an office visit for that group medical visit, provided each and every patient within that group had a bit of a one, -on, had a one on one, no matter how brief, but a one on one interaction documented in their chart. Well, this, the new schedule, which is based on the psychiatry uh, group, psych group counseling, group psychotherapy, um, schedule, as is the specialist group medical visit is also, they're all based on that same schedule, um, allows you to bill a certain, it's, the value is a sliding scale based on the number of patients in the group. And you bill for each and every patient in the group, even if you haven't had to provide an individual service to, all of, to each and every one of them. So let's say you've got a group of 10, and five of them have specific questions to ask. Those questions actually answer the other five's questions as well, so you, they haven't had to ask their question you don't have to take that time to go around and make sure that everybody's had something that you can document in order to satisfy the requirements of the 0100. So this is the sliding scale. The break-even point is, is are between 10 and 11 visits. For less than 10 visits, less than 10 patients in a group, the sliding scale based on an hour and a half group medical visit, which according to the PSP program is the, is the average ideal length of a visit, you will get paid more for the smaller groups than you do on using the 0100 for that same amount of time. For the 11 and over, it's slightly less, but I dare say when you're like when you're getting up to the 15 to 20 ones, you're still looking at about between five and five hundred dollars or so for that hour and a half visit. Well, that's still a pretty decent rate of return for the time spent, particularly when you don't have to be the one who's personally doing the entire part of it. You need to be a part of the visit, but you don't have to be the entire 
part of the visit. So you can have a diabetes education nurse or somebody else who's there to help with running the groups. I don't, I've never done a group medical visit, and if you're interested in looking at them, I would again, I would, I would recommend you, you look at the uh, PSP website because they do have the tutorials on there if you wish to attend one of their modules in order to become better versed in how to run a group medical visit. I think it's well worth it. There are some, one of the places where they're doing this is around group prenatal visits. Now, because that, that, that shared learning and, and that camaraderie between all of these pregnant women um, just goes so long, so far because it, it, sets, it also helps to build relationships with other women that are in similar circumstances. You know, especially when you've got single moms to be or, you know, people who get isolated because, as you know, once you've had a baby, you tend to be isolated in your own. And if you don't have somebody that you've built a relationship with outside, you're at risk of uh, increased risk of depression and a number of other problems because you just don't have anybody to be in contact. So I think group prenatal visits are a great example of a very efficient way of doing this. GP telehealth, again, going beyond the whites of the eyes. So the GP telehealth fees came initially out of a request from the Northern Health, um, particularly for, for providing these services at a distance uh, for First Nations groups out, that are out in, the, out in the community. They initially were you would have to go to the health authority facility to access the video conferencing equipment to get them where they are. You know, with Skype coming up nowadays, things are changing. We have both an in-office and an out-of-office. So if you still have to go to your health authority, to the hospital to provide the service, because that's the only place you have the equipment, then you would use the out-of-office uh, fees for this. If you have it set up within your own office, the level of security is up to you to, dis is up for you, is up to, you to, to determine is secure enough for your patient and you to, to, to feel comfortable with it. So some people are developing a little consent form that they're having patients who want to be cared for for, for some other things over the, over the video conferencing are looking at is Skype secure enough? If they feel Skype is secure enough, if both of you feel it is, then there's a little consent form that people are, are developing to have that acknowledged by the patient. Um, if you don't feel Skype is, 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 uh, is good enough, then the only way you could do this would be to access the full video and conferencing equipment. But as I say, you've got visits, counseling, group counseling, and for those who provide uh, consultation services, if you're providing a consultation service um, to, to another community, then you can build that. The out-of-office ones are 20% higher than the in-office ones, as just as our out-of-office visit fees are all 20% higher than our in-office visit fees. This one is linked back to your talk about the ADHD, the point of care you're in drug screening. Initially, oh, what about four, five, four years ago, um, MSP agreed to allow the SGP to, to allocate some of its new fees or new funds <laughs> towards point of care urine testing for patients, methadone maintenance patients. So only those who were on the, the methadone program um, and GPs, uh, physicians who have had the <coughs> who were, had the exemption to allow them to prescribe methadone could do the urine dip tests and bill for it. We had a request of a, pay, of a couple of GPs providing pain services using methadone saying, but can we, we, this should be extended so that we can test to make sure they're not doing other things and that they're not, that they actually have the methadone. They should have some of the same concerns. And so we took this to MSP and when they stood back and looked at the cost savings they had already achieved from the methadone patients who were no longer having to go to the lab to have all of the urine just for the screening piece done that was costing them $60 per time, and this at the time was like ten dollars um, they looked at the cost savings not only did they say yes it could be for any patient on methadone for any reason they said you know what anytime a doctor feels they need to do urine drug screening in their office and it is just a screening so if you want confirmation on other things you still have to send them to the lab then we'll we'll agree to let you use those little kits they test for six different metabolites in one plus <coughs> the other one it's the methadone alternative as a separate dipstick, um, and we'll let you. We can. You can do that, and we'll we'll agree to open this with a different fee code because the other one is tied to the GPs who build the 00039, which is the methadone maintenance fee. Um, we'll let you do that absolutely because they recognize the cost savings out of the lab budget are quite significant. So in essence, what this has done it has transferred money out of the lab budget into the general practice budget, or whichever, because this isn't actually this isn't actually restricted to GPs. So psychiatry as well, if they want to be doing any of these urine drug screening in their offices, they can, they can purchase these kits and bill and do it and test for it. Because just like with your child who has something's gone wrong, waiting for a week to, tell, to give them the feedback on the behavior that was bad here 
really is not very effective to be able to give them that feedback very quickly. It takes three minutes to do these. They're much like the, the Craig test, except that they're, they've got the six little things that stick down. There's a little trough that you put the urine in and you get the test back very quickly. Obviously, they're not the same as the ones done at uh, the lab where they, monitor, they watch them pee into the cup, so you don't have that continuity for a legal uh, case. But for the, for the clinical purposes that you're going to want to do the screening, absolutely, they're very effective it, to use them in your office. So that's the new one. Um, that's what you can screen for. There's two kits that have been, have been Health Canada approved. If you go on the public side of the SGP website, there's a separate uh, physician information sheet for this that includes the contact information for the suppliers of the kids. Of the kits. Uh, one new uh, immunization that's come up for two and four month olds is the oral um, Lonavax. Uh, if we're providing it in the office in the Greater Vancouver and, and Victoria, at least 90% of the kids, of infants, have their childhood immunizations are done in the GP office, not by public health. And so as a result, that's why we're, we've got the, the immunization schedule so that if you are, you know, these are now, I think they're about $5 a, a per immunization. So for that uh, two-month kid who's getting four different immunizations, that's $20 on top of your office visit, which at least helps to offset the time that it takes to, you know, I hate immunizing kids, but in, I always had a nurse working for me until I moved to Florida and then, and then I had to give them myself. And just, you know, like, I mean, that's, that turns your 20-minute your visit into 40 minutes. Just trying to give the shots at the end of the day. Um, this other one as well, when you're talking about the, the extended health coverage, I also want to link this back. For people who have extended health coverage, your adults who may be going on those true first-line drugs that are not covered by Pharmacare, if Sun Life sends them something that says, we need your GP to fill out a special authority form in order for us to determine that we're going to cover it, because we know that Pharmacare is going to reject it unless you've gone through the, different, the, the hoops that you've had to go through. That is not a medically required special authority form. That is not Pharmacare who is requiring it. That is a third party. And so we've developed a fee code uh, that's at $66 um, to be able to bill to that insurance company. Now, sending them that insurance, that form, that, that letter with just the bill, they're probably going to go, huh? Um, what I would suggest you do is develop a standard form letter that you can send when the patient comes with this request, say, thank you, I have to send them a letter to let them know that there's a fee for this and that they're responsible for it. And then, you know, they'll either stop asking you to fill out the special authority forms and use this Pharmacare as their processing people, um, which is, hey, I'd rather do, the money isn't the big thing, I'd rather do less of them anyways, or they're going to pay you for it. So that's basically the other one, and I think that's the end. Now we have on one of the building the examples that are there. Can I just ask you to go back to the immunization one yep. for a second? Thank you. And uh, you know, I, we can make these slides available as, as printouts. There, um, again, on the SGP website, on the public side, there's a, a billing update and there's information about the immunizations. The five new things that happened basically at, in 2012 are all in that one document. I think there's five, maybe six. Thank you. But yeah, so there's there's been some changes as well. I mean, they're moving the uh, they're moving the MMR from 18 months to the preschool one. So for, by 2015, they'll have developed a combination. They have a combination vaccine of varicella and MMR because they're recommending now a booster of varicella at the preschool time. And when the M those kids who would have gotten their MMR at 18 months um, now who won't get it because it's no longer available, no, no longer to be given at 18 months, but it's to be given at, at preschool, so they want the space in between. They're develop, they'll develop this combination of varicella and MMR to give at preschool as well as their, their tetanus and whatever else they get at the preschool age. And there'll be, the next code will be 10030. So there'll be one new, there'll be another new fee code when we have that combination one. So all of the ones that are individual, there are some individual fee codes. Um, in the member side of the SGP website, I developed a little spreadsheet that goes through all of the different vaccinations and different ages as to when they're given. So you've got the little X's as here's what you give there and here's what you bill for what you're given um, to help people keep track of that. The other thing as well is that they've changed some of the recommendations around hepatitis A in First Nations populations. And so if you're giving those shots in your office, even though it's publicly, public health that's providing you with the serum, you still get to bill for giving the shot. Under age of 19, all of these immunization fees are billable in addition to the office visit. Unfortunately, over the age of 18, so adults, 
um, flu shots and that, you either bill for the flu shot or you bill for the office visit. You can't bill for both. I, eventually, we'd like to be able to get them to agree that flu shots, hepatitis shots, tetanus shots, you know, uh, pneumovax, the ones that are the ones out of the immunization schedule that we give to adults would also be covered the same way, but first we have to have new money to be able to fund that utilization. And until we do, this is at least under 19, you get to the vote. 